on the 19th of September 2022, the Australian Senator Andrew Breck has presented his draft crypto bill and has started public consultation, which is open till the 31st of October 2022. Hi, my name is Dr. Alexei Konosheich and you're on Blockchain State. Let's take a look at what the best Australian crypto friend, I mean among politicians, said about regulation of crypto assets in Australia. Please note that this is a brief overview of the initiative which is primarily based on the words of the senator. In the next videos I'm going to dive deep into his draft bill and will provide my analysis. Subscribe to my channel if you don't want to miss it. Besides, you may want to watch my previous videos on this topic uh, about the undertakings of the Australian politicians and the government. You will find the links down below. I would like to skip that part where Senator Bragg argues about the political agenda of their uh, political opponents of the Labour Party and their government led by the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. But if you wish to read Bragg's criticism of the government's politics around cryptocurrencies, you can read it on the senator's website. I will leave the link in the description. As foreshadowed by the Treasury consultation paper, you can find the link to this paper in the description. This bill includes a licensing regime. This is divided into three license categories, digital asset exchange, digital asset custodian, and stablecoin issuer. The rationale for these licenses is twofold. Firstly, Senator Bragg thinks that by providing a standards-based regime, the regulator will give confidence to the consumer that risk exposure is managed and on par with other financial services and products. Secondly, by providing regulatory certainty, this regime opens the door to greater investment and growth in Australia's crypto ecosystem and virtual economy. The government wants to achieve this with the licensee provisions which proposes minimum capital requirements, conduct regulation and appropriate governance on user activity monitoring and procedures. This is to bring the industry out of the Wild West situation in which it currently resides. Segregation of customer funds to ensure that customer money isn't tied up with corporate funds in the event that a digital currency exchange or custody service declares bankruptcy. Notable recent exchange failures include ICX.io, MyCryptoWallet and Blockchain Global Limited, the last of which collapsed owning 21 million to consumers. Fencing of consumer funds is crucial. Cybersecurity requirements, crypto exchange hacks, considered one of the greatest threats to digital asset consumers and industry standards need to be set to lock in consumer protection and confidence. Requirements for key personnel to be based in Australia. Disclosure requirements to both participants and government agencies. For a custody license, requirements also include designation of key persons to be based within Australia and for proper auditing and disclosure arrangements. The Minister has the responsibility for issuing licensing, ensuring that the Parliament leads these reforms and regulators don't run the show. Under the bill, the financial regulator, ASIC, has the responsibility of administering and enforcing the regime and will be granted monitoring and investigative authority. It's crucial that this industry comes out of the shadows into the light. This bill provides for a transition period as the industry progresses. Senator Bragg comments on two fields, stablecoins and CBDC. Stablecoins. The bill sets out rules for firms wanting to issue stablecoins. Consider the recent collapse of algorithmic stablecoin Terra in the United States, Bloomberg estimates $60 billion went up in smoke in a digital run. By the way, recently, based on these events, I recorded a video that sought an answer on whether 
an owner of a stable coin has the right to get his money back for these coins. Find the link in the description. Senator Bragg offers the minimum reserve standards must be introduced to ensure that stablecoin issuers provide consumers with at least the minimum standard of consumer protection. Referring to stablecoins, the governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, said in December, it's important that these tokens are backed by high quality assets and that they meet high standards, safety and security. Senator Bragg translated, the Australian Parliament should legislate to protect consumers. It is with this in mind that the bill contains provisions mandating that licensees hold in reserve the full amount of the face value of liabilities on issue in the form of the Australian legal tender, read the Australian dollar, or foreign equivalent. The stablecoin issuer must hold the capital in an Australian bank to satisfy their license obligations. Stablecoin could be a solution to addressing the eye-watering problem 1.7 billion people face. They are unbanked. I assume the senator referred to the global problem as the Australian population is only 25 million people. Andrew Breck then notices that unfortunately there are as many risks as there are opportunities when it comes to stable coins. What did Senator Bragg say about CBDCs? As the world moves on central bank digital currencies, Australia needs to keep up with both the risks and opportunities. In the final report last October, the committee recommended that Treasury lead a policy review into the viability of a retail central bank digital currency in Australia. On reflection, given the scale of policy reform recommendations, uh, the committee, the Senate committee made, the CBDC recommendation was undercooked, as Andrew Brack concluded. I was wrong to recommend a retail CBDC without deeply considering the privacy slash big state implications. There are numerous privacy issues that could outweigh the benefits and we should not have been as positive as we were. The RBA has recently initiated a CBDC inquiry. They said it was questioning whether there is really a use case for a retail CBDC in Australia, given the involved nature of our traditional payments industry. Andrew Bragg remains unconvinced that a central bank should be running critical economic and security policy like digital payments when their primary role is monetary policy management. In a recent article in the South China Morning Post, it was reported that Chinese central bank data showed that not only 4.6 million merchant outlets accepted CBDC payments, but more than 261 million digital wallets have been opened, totaling 83 billion yuan for 12.2 uh, billion US. This is across 23 pilot regions in China. The electronic yuan is currently in its pilot phase and cross-border payments are being trailed with United Arab Emirates, Hong Kong and Thailand. It's not currently available in Australia, but under the two-tiered approach, Chinese state-owned banks are primary uh, disseminators of the electronic yuan via digital wallets. If the electronic yuan was introduced into Australia, Chinese state-owned banks would be the main payment facilitators. In the bill, we have therefore deemed it necessary to have provisions requiring that these electronic yuan facilitators, Chinese state-owned banks, disclose data to APRA and the RBA on its use in Australia. Specifically, the bill requires that these banks report on the aggregate quantity of Australian businesses who have accepted electronic yuan payments, the quantity of digital wallets opened by Australian customers and the aggregate quantity electronic yuan held in those wallets. The reason this act specifically targets the electronic yuan is because it is the first CBDC to be issued by a major economy and Chinese financial influence is particularly 
relevant in our Pacific region, concluded Andrew Bragg. The electronic yuan may be a vastly more successful endeavor than China's efforts to supplant the US dollar with the yuan. As The Economist reported earlier this month, the electronic yuan could help internationalize the yuan in several ways. It could make it easier and cheaper for foreigners, cross-border payments and harder for America to block those transactions for geopolitical purposes. In our own region where access to banking and payment systems can be challenging and expensive, the electronic yuan may prove to be very popular. A CBDC remittance could cost virtually nothing. In a time of conflict, this system would presumably be out of reach of sanctions issued by governments and also outside the reach of U.S. parented big tech organizations. We need to closely analyze the development and expansion of the electronic yuan in conjunction with wider developments in the CBDC space if we are to preempt the risks of currency substitution and privacy breaches. Transparency is part of the solution. Andrew Bragg concludes that Australians are free to provide feedback to Parliament to the laws that we make. The draft bill I am releasing is laid out with a dual purpose in mind, consumer protection and innovation. I would love to know your thoughts on this draft bill. What do you like and what do you hate? What would help the industry and what would hinder it? What would help protect consumers and what would expose consumers to undue risk? Starting Monday, I will be seeking comments and submissions from the industry for the next six weeks and encourage you to have your say. Sounds not bad taking into account how untransparent some governments in other countries are in terms of regulating crypto. I hope it's for the best of Australia. Stay tuned to hear more details on that bill. Thank you.